For those of you who, who know me kind of well, or for those of you who maybe just met me, one thing you know is I love coffee. I want everyone to know that as long as I am here at Savior the Nations in some form, there will be coffee after every service. Every Bible study we have, every ESL class, there will always be a fresh brew of coffee. Now, th there's a lot of different ways to make coffee. As some of you know, we, we use a percolator here at our church. A percolator is a pretty easy way to make coffee. You basically heat water at the bottom of the container, and, and as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the water splashes up to this container with coffee grounds. And after an, a, a lot of those waves, that beautiful sound of the, of, the, of the water mixing with the grounds, you get a cup of that fresh-smelling brew of coffee. Now, I know that I'm not the only coffee lover here. Maybe some of you who make coffee at home use a French press. When I go camping, I, I like to use an aero press, another fancier method. Maybe you make cappuccinos. But there's one type of coffee that's very hard to make. There's one type that you have to be a grand master to perfect, and that is Turkish coffee. I'm not sure if many of you have had Turkish coffee, and I don't have time to go into all of it, although ask me after the service, maybe we can talk. To make Turkish coffee, you need to grind those beans very, very fine. You need to grind them so much, it's like a dust a powder. Our grinder isn't good enough to make that type. I, I have a hand grinder at home, but it would take about 10 minutes at least for a little cup like that. This is the thing that makes Turkish coffee so hard. You have to hold it, this little container with a wooden handle. It's kind of like a spoon and you need to hold it over a flame. And this is the key. You need to let it get pretty, pretty hot, almost close to boiling, but don't let it pop. You see, if the water isn't hot, you'll just have like a mud. It won't mix. But if you heat it too hot and, and the water pops like a bubble, you lose all the goodness and, and, and all the flavor. So you repeat that process again and again until it's perfect. You see, making Turkish coffee is very labor intensive. It's very, very hard, but oh, is it good. A few months ago, Pastor and I enjoyed a cup of Turkish coffee just down on Victoria. Why am I talking about coffee? I'm talking about coffee because in our lesson for today, Paul, and throughout his letter, is making Turkish coffee. Paul is making this delicate balance about the authentic gospel which saves us. It, it, starting in today's lesson and as we'll see in the coming weeks, we heard that there were these false teachers who were coming with an old, dirty message, like coffee left in a percolator for days. Ugh. They were coming with a message that to be a Christian, you have to live a certain lifestyle. In short, we say you have to live by the works of the law. But these people were saying to be a Christian, there are certain people you have to hang around, you have to dress and live a certain way, eat certain foods, or else you're not a Christian. L l let's hear again what Paul says in our lesson as he makes this balance. He says, 
As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognize that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Bartimus the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. You see, Paul is making this balance between this gospel that is for both Jews and Gentiles. That is, people from, descended physically from Israel who who live according to that culture and those customs, and for the rest of the world. Every one of us here, non-Jews. You see, if Paul were combating these teachers and he were saying that his message is authentic because really important people accept it, people like James and Peter and John, then his teachers would say, ah, you just heard the gospel secondhand from these people. You, 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 you've added your own little bits to it and you, you don't understand it. On the other extreme, if Paul doesn't emphasize that his message agrees with God's word, in this case, God's chosen apostles like Peter and John, then they would say, well, we can't trust what you say. You're not in line with Jesus and his disciples. But Paul needed to defend this authentic Christianity. He didn't want to let it boil over like Turkish coffee can do, and he didn't want to let it sit in the mud like the old ways before the law came. This is why when, when he speaks, he says uh, on the one hand, there were those who held in high, in high esteem, those esteemed as pillars. He's saying, you know, these important teachers do, did agree with what I wrote, with what I have taught you. But at the same time, he says, they added nothing to my message. That God does not show favoritism. It makes no difference to me who they were. Because Paul wants the people to know the gospel doesn't depend on specific people. It doesn't depend on any one of them or today on any one of us. But it depends on the truth that Christ preached. And as I told the children, all of us who have this message can live it, can speak it, no matter how old or young we are, no matter what country we are from, no matter if we're male or female, famous or not famous, right, rich or poor. The gospel doesn't depend on us. It depends on Christ. Paul says that the God who was at work in Peter was also in work in at him. And let me, let me say one thing about the word use here. The, the word that Paul uses here comes into the English language as energy. When God works in someone, it's like energy, he says. What is energy? Right, energy is some type of force that makes something happen. Right? Energy makes the lights turn on. Energy lets us get up in the morning. Coffee gives you a lot of energy when you drink it, but not, not too much. You see, it doesn't matter who we are. God's gospel is always energetic. It, it, it's always at work, no matter where we are from. The problem 
that Paul addresses, though, is that some people were not using this energy. There's a word that Paul uses for Peter, and it's this word hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. What's kind of interesting about this word is that it comes from the Greek theater. You see, back in the day, they didn't have special effects like today where we use computers to make things seem a different way. In Paul's day, they could not use what's called a, 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 a green screen where you stand behind a screen of a certain color, usually green, and then a computer makes that image look like something else. Like if you've watched the weather, that's how they make that map appear behind them. When you put on a mask, you look different than who you are. Unfortunately, Paul says, this is what Peter was doing. Now think of who Peter is, right? Peter is the, the A-plus disciple. To be sure, Jesus loved all his 12 disciples. But if there was one star student, you might say, it would be Peter. Peter was the first person who confessed openly that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, and not just a prophet, not, not just a teacher. Yet we see here what is actually comforting that even though Peter was being a hypocrite, the gospel still did its work. It doesn't depend on people, even people as important as Peter. I, I, I want to hear, I want us to hear again what Paul said about this unfortunate episode. And by the way, Paul uses here Peter's Aramaic name, Cephas. He says, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. And when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. You see the hypocrisy here? Peter was making non-Jews live like Jews in order to be saved. Now, at least when I, when I hear this, it's a little hard for me to imagine. A lot of people call this table fellowship. That is, in Paul's day, it was a very big deal who you sat at a table with to eat. I mean, it may just be me, but in so much of my daily life, eating at, whether it's cafes or a food court or a bench in the park, I'm so used to just eating around whoever happens to be there. It doesn't make a big difference to me. When I see our potlucks after church, I, I don't see too many fights about who gets to sit where or people offended when you sit in front of them. But that may just be me. The thing that brings it home for me though is when you eat dinner at your home. I would bet that for most of us, perhaps even all of us, you only invite people to eat at your table at home if it's someone you have a relationship with, someone that you're close with. We don't usually invite random people or people we don't like to have a meal with us at our home. What I mean is when we eat dinner at our home with people, when we invite them, it's special. When I've eaten dinner at any of your houses, it's, it's a special time. It's a way to say, we're together. 
But Peter, at least at this time, he was, this, he was the pastor there in Antioch. And he was eating with Jews and non-Jews because the gospel is for Jews and non-Jews. The gospel is for all who believe. But sadly, what happened is that when there was this group of apparently very influential, very important people who came to visit, Paul, or sorry, Peter stopped eating with them. He said, oh, no, no, I, I don't eat with, with, with non-Jews. And Peter was sending a message that in order to be a real Christian, in order to be a true Christian, you need to be a Jew. You, you need to live like a Jew. You need to obey all the, the laws and customs that we talked about in our Bible site the last several months on the Old Testament ceremonial law. See, the issue was not just that Peter was being a jerk or mean. The issue was that he was saying the gospel depends on you doing something. The gospel depends on you eating the right food, living a certain way, wearing certain clothes. Of course, this is what we call hypocrisy. And sadly, Paul had to confront Peter to his face, he says. We, we, we hear that Peter lost face in front of everyone because of this. But you know what? The gospel doesn't depend on Peter. The gospel was still preached. In this case, God used the apostle Paul to, to call him to repent. And when we, when we hear about episodes like this, it makes us think if, if someone as, as educated, at least with the Lord and, and, and as influential like Peter, can be this hypocritical, what about me? It makes us think, are there masks that, that we wear? Do, do, do we have personal insecurities or does our society or our culture make us wear a certain face when we're here together on church, in church, but when we leave church, we act a different way? Do we maybe share table fellowship here at church, but if we go outside or go somewhere else, we, we wouldn't look at the other person? God's word shows us that when we are hypocrites, God still gets his word out there. The gospel is still at work, like I said, that, that energy. And the reason is because all of us, more than our culture or our identities or our personalities, all of us are Christians when we believe the gospel. It might be a little weird to think about, but when we come to faith in Christ, the Bible says that he makes us a different person. It says that a new person is born in us. And don't get me wrong, when, when you become a Christian, you of course still have your own personality and you have your own culture, you have your own background, your own relationships. But we see that above all of those, is our relationship as Christians. And that, that, that changes everything. And the word that Paul uses to talk about this change in our status before God is one of our favorite words as Lutherans. It's this word justify or justification. The word justification means to be declared not guilty. Justification is when the authority, like that judge, makes a decision and says, you are in the right. You are not guilty. In fact, even more than that, God declares us to be in, in the right. It doesn't depend on us, as you can see. It only depends on what Christ has done. Christ who lived for us, 
died for us and rose again. I, I want us to hear as, as we end how Paul described this justification that he gives us. He says, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This truth is why getting our theology right is so important. In the same way that when you make Turkish coffee, it's important to not mess it up. Not to have it be too hot or too cold. God's pure gospel that we are justified is a truth that goes against every culture and every thought that we have as, as, as sinful human beings which is why it is so precious. And what's great about being a Christian with, with every one of you here is that we, we get to see God at work. It is true that when we eat together for our feast meals, God is at work and, and that fellowship that we have. When we, as Paul says, remember the poor, when we preach the gospel to those who don't know about Jesus, when we help our neighbor, simply because we have this love from Christ that compels us to do so, that's, that's God at work. And Jesus tells us that when he comes back to judge the living and the dead, we can be sure that we will be justified. That we will publicly, you might say, gain face that God will tell all of us we are his people no matter where we are from or what, what country we, we, we come from, whatever have you. And this is a message worth preserving, a message that depends only on God's unchangeable word. And we thank God for that word. Amen.